Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Meng Cheng. I'm the John A. Everson Dean of College of Engineering here. Uh, and welcome to uh, spring weather. Uh, today, we are above freezing temperature. So compared to Monday, we're now officially in spring. And uh, we also uh, take great delight in welcoming back uh, an alum who has done amazing work throughout uh, her career and welcome her back to both give a fireside chat and to give a lecture afterwards. Um, this is part of the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series where we bring the brightest minds around the world in different engineering disciplines to be here at Purdue. And it takes great delight for me to introduce Lila Abraham, who is one of our own from electrical engineering. Uh, and uh, she has traversed so many different paths. It's hard to summarize everything in a brief introduction, but I'll say that uh, part of uh, what she's gonna talk about today will be on entrepreneurship with social impact uh, and with diversity impact. Uh, she has uh, both in her capacity at Kleiner Perkins and Intel uh, and uh, startup uh, now is very big, Coursera, uh, served in different roles in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, but also personally been doing a lot of social entrepreneurship with impact in different countries. And then afterwards, uh, she will also uh, talk about the research advances happening at DeepMind, where she's serving as the Chief Operations Officer since last year. And prior to that, uh, she uh, has also worked in different capacities related to AI, machine learning, and uh, implications to different scientific engineering fields. What is amazing about DeepMind, I think, is since being founded what about a decade ago uh, in London, uh, and being acquired by Google and Alphabet about five years ago, uh, DeepMind is uh, like a university research institute or college, uh, but without some of the bureaucratic processes involved uh, in AI. And it has attracted some of the very best talents around the world to London and its branches uh, in other parts of the globe and it has made tremendous advances documented in nature, science, other publications in an interdisciplinary way, bringing together traditional machine learning and engineering and scientists along with neuroscientists, with ethics, with the humanities and social sciences in a beautiful combination. So thank you, Lila, so much for sparing your time with us here today back at Purdue in ways more than one. Now, we're gonna start with uh, the first topic in entrepreneurship and introducing also my great colleague, uh, Arnold Chen, who uh, directs the Bert Morgan Center for Entrepreneurship. And Arnold, along with his colleagues, also in Purdue Research Foundation, the Foundry, and other parts of the ecosystem, been doing an amazing job in getting us to where we are today. The Wall Street Journal ranked last year Purdue, number six in the world, number three in the country in number of startups created licensing Purdue technologies. And that is just one statistics among many we can brag about because of efforts by colleagues like you. So thank you, Arnold, for having this moderation for the Fireside Chat today with Lila. So welcome both Lila and Arnold. Well, welcome back. Thank you. So I, I kind of just—I know there's a lot of stuff we want to talk about, so I'm just kind of kind of jump right into it. So, walk us back to your decision that brought you to Purdue. If you can think back, what what made you choose Purdue? What else were you looking at? Uh, I actually am from Lafayette, Indiana, uh, and I went to Harrison High School. So I grew up basically on Purdue campus. From the time I was a young child, I was actually taking classes at Purdue. There were a lot of activities for uh, youth. And then when I was in high school, even our senior, my senior classes, my final exams for calculus were Purdue uh, exams, so I was mm -hmm. able to test out of a lot. So by the time I started Purdue, I actually had about 49 credits. So I was really looking at, uh, here's a campus I know, top engineering school. 
um, or I could go somewhere else. I was thinking about MIT, but I think the quality of education, the proximity, and I was really interested in the co-op program, and that is how I ended up at Purdue. Did you always know you wanted to be an engineer? Oh, no. I wanted to be an archaeologist. I wanted to be a translator. And then my parents sat me down and said, it's easier to get out of engineering than to get into engineering. So why don't you start there and then figure out really where you want your path to go. OK. What were you like as a student, if you can remember back? What was Lila back <laughs> so as the electrical I, engineer? I have a classmate in the audience, so they're going to hold me to uh, be honest here. Um, uh, I think I worked really hard. Um, the, I, I developed my resilience, I think, at Purdue. I was a member of Phi Sigma Rho, the engineering uh, sorority, so really trying to connect with other uh, women engineers as well, because there was a limited pool within EE, mm -hmm. but also found like a lot of collaboration with my male colleagues. So I think it was like a kind of very social in terms of, you know, it was both the academic aspect as well as getting to know who my colleagues were, especially because Purdue was so familiar to me. Um, and then the other thing was, at the time we used to carry tackle boxes. I don't know if these yeah. students here still carry tackle boxes. Okay, we had resistors, capacitors, and mine was purple. I remember and mine was blue. Was it? Yeah, and, and I painted mine. So okay. I was often known as the, the girl with the purple tackle box. Um, it, and I got really involved in the International Center. So it, it was a chance for me to take a more global perspective while still being um, here in Lafayette. And then, would, if you can remember, were there any favorite, least favorite classes that, that you took? Clearly wore the wrong clothing. I actually have fond memories. I can't remember the circ the, whatever class we had, the tackle box, the lab. I have very fond memories of, of that one as well. I liked um, a lot of the optics class, classes, the semiconductor. But what I found was actually I liked doing a little bit of a lot of things rather than one topic and going deep. So I ended up doing a, a generalist um, double E degree. What I did not like, which is kind of ironic, so don't judge me, uh, but I did not want to do computer classes. Um, so in fact, when I first interviewed uh, for my co-op, which I'm sure we'll get to, uh, my dad gave me the sage advice of like, don't tell Intel that you don't like computers. <laughs> Pretty good advice. So then you end up doing a co-op while, while you were, you were studying. Yes. And, was that, and that was obviously at Intel? Yes. I was actually Purdue's first co-op ever to go to Intel. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's awesome. And so did you, you went out to the Santa Clara? Yeah, we, uh, yes. I actually wanted to go to the East Coast. And my dad, my wise dad, who, who uh, told me, he said, um, I've heard of this company out on California called Intel, and I see them on your list. You really should talk to them. I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to go out there. I'm like, who is this? What is this company? Anyway, and that's where the don't tell me you don't like computers came mm -hmm. from. What other kind of organizations or things did you do on campus while you were, while you were here? Uh, were I, there any other student organizations you were part of? I think Phi Sigma Rho. Um, uh -huh. this, Society of Women Engineers, the International Center. I did a lot of volunteer work as well. A community service was important in my upbringing, so it was a chance for me to also get involved. But when I was at Purdue, I also really tried to focus on my academics because during my co-op sessions, um, that's when I was able to do other things. Like when I was in California, I took fencing, for example. I did art classes. So I tried to have a more uh, portfolio approach to uh, my college years. OK. So for the students who are all sitting out here, what advice would you give them looking back now to make the most of their time on campus? Uh, I think there's a couple things. One is it's OK to sample and to try different things. Figure out what really gets you excited. Uh, you don't have to make a decision and, and stay with it for a long time. In fact, these are the years that you should be kind of experimenting with different clubs and activities. Uh, hobbies, interests. I think that, that, and Purdue has so much to offer. In fact, I've been sh really impressed uh, in my meetings here at Purdue to learn how much more the university has to offer than it did when we were students. Yeah. Um, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's uh, programs in community service or uh, uh, working in cross-functional teams, and I think that's really unique. So 
Purdue offers a lot. Uh, take advantage of it, learn from it. You'll make, build a great network, and you'll develop skills. I think the other uh, suggestion I have is, and I, I was talking with a couple of the women engineering seminars earlier today, and I always start by my third slide, I talk about failure. Because I think it's really hard for, uh, it can be hard for Purdue engineers who are extremely talented, got the grades to get into Purdue, and all of a sudden you're faced with a new reality, like the quality of your peer group, the complexity of the courses, the intensity of everything you're trying to do in university. And it's really easy to like mess up on a test or maybe a, a class doesn't go as you plan. And I had that experience. And it would have been really easy, and I've seen this happen, to opt out of like, oh, I, that's it, I can't do it. And instead, uh, I think there's an opportunity to say, what, what did I learn from this? Mm -hmm. uh, what support do I need? How, what are the other uh, scaffolding that I need to learn this subject? How can I rely on my peers, my TAs, et cetera? And I think that element of resilience, so my suggestion is if you face some adversity while you're here, don't be scared of it, don't let it stop you. In fact, lean into it a little bit and use it as a learning opportunity because years, you know, I'm 20, 20 plus, almost 30 years down the road, and that class that I failed doesn't matter, right? I've had a very successful career despite that. And in fact, in some ways, because of that, because I learned how to persevere and yeah, to work through those forward. problems. Yes. Yeah. So then moving on after graduating from Purdue, the first job you had was at Intel. Correct. And I noticed that you had a lot of international experience. You had two different stints overseas. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, the story of my going to Tokyo is pretty interesting. I was on a rotation program at Intel, and uh, one of my, uh, through the rotations, people had discovered that I speak Japanese because I was an exchange student in Japan in high school. And so when an opportunity came up to start this new technology in Japan, they came to me and asked if I would be interested, and I'm like, oh, that sounds amazing. So I went to my manager, and. I said, um, I really want, I'm really excited I have this opportunity to move to Tokyo. Um, and to this other group at Intel wants to sponsor me. And he looked at me and he said, you're ruining your career. What are you doing? And what I realized later was he was putting his own career path in perspective. He wanted me to follow him because he saw that as a successful career path. And that's great. That's what he wanted for himself, but it wasn't what I wanted. The best part of that conversation was I told them what I would be working on, this next generation type of CD and video type of work. And he didn't understand. And he said, who's ever going to watch a movie on a computer? Yeah. You know, There's never going to be a computer in a living room. You're wasting your time not realizing that DVD. You know, I was um, the computer industry representative into a lot of those conversations around DVD standards, which led to things like copy protection, and software encode and decode, which now, you know, uh, DVD is now obsolete. So when I tell people I worked on DVD, most people are like, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> um, being in Tokyo and having such success of getting a seat around the table, I think sometimes being a foreign woman, young, American, uh, from the computer industry, it was like everything that they didn't expect yeah. And so it opened a lot of doors for me because I think it piqued people's curiosity. And it gave me a chance to actually uh, use my difference as uh, an advantage in the conversations to uh, maybe push in ways that I couldn't have. Right. So being the only woman in the room, you were able to use that as an advantage and not as a, a barrier, so to speak. Right. Right. And, and speaking Japanese certainly helped. And then from there, I went to Hong Kong to set up Intel's developer program. At the time, a lot of the computer industry peripherals were being developed in Taiwan, and Intel wanted to try to, um, to work with the ecosystem uh, to align roadmaps and to really have that conversation. And because I had proven both with my engineering skills and ability to work in foreign markets um, and with a broad range of stakeholders, uh, that I'd be a good candidate to go start Intel's developer program, which led uh, to Hong Kong. And then, Ten years later in my career, I moved to Shanghai uh, to start um, to grow Intel's education program. It was an education technology program called the Classmate PC. Mm -hmm. 
and it was a worldwide group, but with uh, manufacturing and some of the engineering in China, I was based in Shanghai. And then in between there, you ended up rising in the ranks to ultimately become chief of staff of the CEO, Craig Barrett. Yes. How does one go about getting a job like that, even at you know, a 10,000 person company? Yeah, in fact, we were about 85,000 people. 85,000, okay. <laughs> um, so I think uh, also what happened in between all of that is I went on a sabbatical at Intel after seven years you get to have two months off. So um, clearly my father has played an important role in my becoming an engineer and he grew up in an orphanage in Lebanon. So I went back to that orphanage and built a computer lab during my sabbatical. Uh, and I, Craig Barrett, uh, he is an engineer without a business uh, degree and he rose to the ranks of CEO. He was um, Intel's manufacturing powerhouse, was kind of his, his uh, rise to fame. Uh, then also, he really believed in education. He had a, a saying of computers aren't magic, teachers are. Uh, computers are the tool. And so I think he, um, I, had, I had been through so many different roles at Intel that somebody knew my name and passed it on to him. So I was invited to interview and got got the job in his final years as CEO and transitioned to chairman. So what is the, can you explain the role of the chief of staff to, to us? What, what does that entails and what's kind of like a, a, a day in the life of that like? Yeah, it's, I, I never, I didn't go get my MBA, but I kind of feel like that was my Learning by fire. Yes, exactly. Literally by like by fire. fire at times. So uh, my role was a little bit of everything. Um, it my first project was uh, Andy Grove and, and Craig were thinking about healthcare, and so they said, "What is it, what's happening within the company within healthcare?" Lila, go find out. You have two weeks to pull something together. Um, so kind of navigating around trying to un unlock things, and it, that led to a formation of an Intel health group. Um, I also did things like um, when he, uh, p part of the role is a technical advisor, so helping to think through strategic direction, uh, communications, uh, dig into certain projects within the organization that are, are of high priority to him. Then when he became chairman, um, hit retirement age from CEO and transitioned to chairman, I asked him, Craig, you know, what's, what do you see your role as chairman being like? How, how do you need my job to evolve? And he looked at me and he said, you're smart. You go figure it out. Um, and it was an extremely empowering moment because uh, we then uh, pivoted and he became kind of a global evangelist around the intersection of technology and social impact because it aligned with his passions. So we would travel to about 20 countries a year, including the middle of the Amazon or Colombia or India and across Africa. And we would work on building out wireless infrastructure and compute and uh, computing capability and help build the local capacity to sustain and uh, manage this. So what that meant was you could suddenly unlock uh, capabilities in the local community, such as uh, entrepreneurship, healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, helping farmers get weather data, helping teachers teach with a computer as a tool. So it was a really cool couple of years and filled up my passport. Yeah, I can only imagine. And with your experience, having, having two stints already overseas, it seemed like it was a perfect fit to, yes. to continue traveling around the world. So from there, after that last role in Intel, you were recruited away to the most prominent venture capital firm in the Valley, Kleiner Perkins. Tell us how that, that process went about. Uh, I don't, it's interesting because I, I, venture capital wasn't on my radar. And nor was being entrepreneurial. In fact, when I was at Intel, someone actually told me, uh, I, I did an executive program um, at Harvard, and someone said, you know, Lila, you're really an entrepreneur. And I'm like, what's, what's that? And they said, oh, it's like an entrepreneur, but within the framework of a large company. And all of a sudden, my career made sense to me, because I had opened new markets, started new businesses, and once I had that framing, it was actually really helpful for me because when Kleiner Perkins came, 
and I really didn't know that much about venture capital, but I thought, here's a chance to take my experience from corporate and work with entrepreneurs to see how I might be able to share some of those best practices, whether it's how do you think about global uh, businesses, how do you think about growing an organization, Intel has objectives and key results, which are kind of prevalent across Silicon Valley now. You know, what aspects of my background can I help a startup? So I, uh, and so I went in as a senior operating partner um, to help run the firm, do some business development, and uh, help with uh, some of the investments. Okay, and then having now sat on the, what I'll call the other side of the table, on the venture capital side, what kind of advice can you give the young entrepreneurs who are gonna start saying, okay, if they're going into that first pitch or kind of common mistakes you see in those pitches that you, know, you might be able to shed some light on? Um, I think that they're, first of all, be, do your homework, know who you're talking to uh, from on the investor side. Uh, why should they invest in, in you and your idea? Is there something about their background that's special, something about their investment thesis? I saw a lot of entrepreneurs just trying to raise money but not thinking about what the direct correlation was. Meaning why that firm? Why that firm, why, why that partner, exactly. Yeah. And I think that was actually, it just, it doesn't, um, it's surprising, it feel, to me that feels like kind of one of the basics. Like know um, who your audience is. No, yes, and sometimes you, know, you have to do that homework because if someone invests that you don't want like later you find out there's values misalignment or maybe the way that they work with their other companies isn't how you like to work. Um, you know, it's hard to get rid of investors, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you have to be very thoughtful up front when you're, you're recruiting your investor. Um, the other thing too is uh, most VCs make the investment not just in the idea, but is there a market for it? How's the team look? Do you, it's very rare that an initial idea is exactly what goes to market. So will this team with this idea be able to pivot as needed and adjust based on what they learn? And can they move quick enough and fail fast and experiment quickly to be able to integrate and make those adjustments? So a lot of times when you get interviewed about your own skills or capabilities, some of those conversations, uh, stories about like resilience or adaptation, um, how you got your testing quickly, like how you were scrappy, are actually really important because they signal what type of entrepreneur you're going to be. And it'll also help them know like what your limitations are. Some entrepreneurs can grow as a company scales and some are, are less able to do so. And did you find that those types of, being able to show those types of attributes could kind of overcome the first time entrepreneur sig stigma of, Students are, you know, people who come in and say, well, I've never started a company or this isn't my fourth company. Yeah, I think we saw a lot of, we invested in a lot of first-time entrepreneurs who did their homework, who were thoughtful, uh, who were also humble um, and knew that they had a lot to learn along the way. Uh, the interesting thing for me was I, I expected coming in from such a well-run organization like Intel into venture capital, especially into Kleiner Perkins, that there would be some magic checklist of uh, how to think through things. And what you realize is every partner has a different philosophy. And, and, and every also a different has, methodology yes, of how they make diligence. the decisions. Yeah. It's part of why you need to know your audience. I see. Were there any specific either kind of companies that you can specifically remember, like the big pitches, or that might be obviously household names today that had gone through that boardroom while, while you were there? Oh, there's so many. One of the first companies I did a lot of diligence on was Twitter when it was a $3 billion valuation. So it was still kind of fairly early-ish at the time. Um, there was a, a company which recently went public called Beyond Meat. Uh, which was really fun because part, uh, once we made the investment, we got to actually try with a chef all the different uh, products. That was really fun. Uh, but there were so many that are doing really well today. Some succeeded, some failed. But what I was always impressed with was the passion, the creativity, the vision that entrepreneurs had as they came through the door. How they want to change the world. How, and some of them, the science behind some of the things that were happening in, um, especially in more of the, with the environment focus and green tech, 
which is so fascinating. It's like I didn't realize that some of this was even possible. Um, so it was, it was a really interesting and good time. And of course, the big one for me was doing diligence on Coursera. OK, so that segues very nicely into the next phase of your career, which was meeting two Stanford professors who had an idea, and then ultimately getting that company started. So tell us a little bit about that. How, like, do you still remember that first pitch and oh, sitting? Oh, totally. And it was around this time of year, actually, that it happened. So uh, how many people here have taken a Coursera class? Oh, wow. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, you know, my passion for education mm -hmm. and working closely with John Doerr, who, who is the, uh, the venture capitalist who made the first investments in Google and in Amazon and Jeff Bezos, for those of you who don't know his name. Uh, John and I were working really closely together, and he had gotten a call from Stanford that said this experiment was running on Stanford campus, and they had actually figured something out. So they had done a flipped classroom. So the idea was put a machine learning course out so that when students kind of get together in their class that they can talk about something other than the lecture. And Andrew Ng, who um, does the machine learning class, realized that there were 100,000 people taking his machine learning class. 100,000? 100, 100,000. And he's like, this would have taken me 250 years if I was uh, teaching, teaching this, yeah. on campus. And it really, and at the time, this is, um, gosh, I think if I'm remembering right, around 2011. Um, so it, it, was a, it wasn't a very popular subject at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, we saw that, and same with the computer science uh, course that was being taught. So we, uh, uh, we made the investment. Of course, Kleiner Perkins made an investment in Coursera. I worked closely with Daphne and Andrew, the co-founders, who were professors uh, who hadn't been in a company, really built a company before. And they, uh, we all got along quite well in my business experience. And then I was eventually asked to come in when the company was still less than 40 people as kind of the outside executive partnering with them to help kind of take Coursera on its next stage of growth. Was that a difficult decision at all to, to join the team and leave your role at Kleiner? Um, yes and no. The yes part is um, I, I really, I mean, Intel was a, a, a large, stable company. Kleiner Perkins, if I was going to leave, Intel was a very prominent venture yeah. capital. And all of a sudden, I'm going into uh, a company of less than 40 people. So it has maybe 18 months of funding. And <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was. So from that perspective of being at that point in my life, was, was um, a little bit difficult. So I, I actually made a little bit of a slower transition. I did some advising first, but then all of a sudden I'm there every day. And um, I eventually made the transition over. The easy part of it was I was really passionate about what the team was doing. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot working with Daphne and Andrew. And the chance to have an impact on millions of learners worldwide, you know, every week at um, our all hands meeting, we would read um, stories and emails from our learners and about the impact that Coursera classes had had. So it was a very fulfilling, uh, very fulfilling experience. What were the early days like? What's the, if you can go kind of go back to your first year, kind of give the, the students an idea of, okay, typical day was, you know, at an early startup. <laughs> Unpredictable. Un completely unpredictable. Uh, exciting and fun and t tons of energy. Um, you know, I when I started, I met with everybody in the company, which you can do when the organization is that yeah. size. I think I did. I met everybody up until about 100 people. And then it was uh -huh. just getting difficult to manage. Um, uh, no real rules, because everything is, you know, you're so. You're a startup, so. Right. Yeah, you're, one minute you're talking about, uh, the ped pedagogy, the next minute you're talking about some legal contract, then you're like talking about how do we build a business model, wait a minute, this employee has an issue with this other employee. Like, it's just everything all at once. And um, I found that you couldn't really prepare for a day. The other thing that was interesting is because of the academic background, we did everything in Google Docs, and everything was like a lot of pages because everyone in the company was so smart and so passionate about education. And to someone like me, who was an engineer, 
I'm like, I went into engineering so I wouldn't have to do English, and all of a sudden I'm reading these long papers <laughs> uh, every day. Uh, but it was a very collaborative, mission-driven uh, environment, and it was super exciting. Like, I think back to those days with great fondness. How would you describe the company culture that you, you know, tr strive to, to build there? Yeah, I, it was very much about um, collaboration because when you think about what we were trying to do, uh, we were working with universities on, on one hand and then also with learners worldwide. And so everything we, we were doing was dependent on this, these ecosystems working well together and providing value um, to the learners that they felt they perceived value um, and to the university so they would continue engaging. Uh, so it required a lot of cross-functional collaboration within, the, within Coursera in the early days. And then we also struggled with how do you bring a business mindset into something like this that feels very mission-driven? A lot of employees actually ha initially had a very difficult time uh, trying to think about what a sustainable path was. Um, and Versus kind of just being a nonprofit and making all this free, it's how do you right, make and, money? And so how do you, in order to do good in the world, we had to do well so that we could have the, the money to fund where we needed to go. Uh, but it was a cultural shift for a lot of people once you get, got, we got to a, a larger stage. And then another one was um, in the early days, there's no process. And so when you start to put things into place, like after a while, people want to know that they have a career path here. So how do you start putting? Um, the growing pains as, yes. you're, as you're going through. And, and doing process, pro, process in a way that doesn't feel like it, like it serves some purpose, which is you want to provide um, a fair environment for people to develop. You want to. Like the first time you have to roll out the performance review process. Exactly. Yeah. And, and yes, and have development conversations and deal with compensation adjustments and like the people stuff to me. And I'm not trained on that. I've like learned how to do it just by doing it. Uh, but it's always way more complicated than figuring out, okay, how do we um, iterate on this product or uh, deal with some of the compute issues. Mm -hmm. One thing I've, I've kind of noted when we've talked with a lot of entrepreneurs that most students, for example, don't know is that almost every startup goes within six months or even six weeks of running out of cash. And this includes companies like Amazon, Nike, Netflix. Did Coursera have struggles like that where there are tough decisions to make or kind of forks in the road that when you look back were much easier in hindsight, but at the time were agonizing? Uh, we managed our, our cash well and had okay. plenty of uh, investment, so we were fine from a cash runway perspective. But the monetization part of the culture was a big, uh, a big shift. Um, so we, we the, the struggles really were more of how do we partner with, you know, how do you partner with universities and still kind of influence the type of content that you want to get, um, so that it delivers the right type of value for the. Right. Learner, because at the time, wouldn't universities have viewed that you guys as competitors? Uh, yes and no. Like it, it, the jury was still out on all of that. So, in many ways, they just gave us whatever content they had, rather than thinking, "Oh, here's this emerging field of data science, and we have this unique skill set. We're going to really do a, a class well and do it on data science." So, what we ended up having to do was shift it from taking whatever content came to us to thinking about. What's happening in the industry? What do companies want? So doing the interviews with companies saying, you know, how are you trying to upskill or reskill employees? Where are you finding knowledge gaps? And then developing an entire content strategy uh, at, while also capturing some of the best practices and pedagogy that we could share with the university. So we were making requests of here's the type of content we need and here are some of the best practices that we need to see in the content as it comes onto our platform. And so in a lot of your roles, you've been in the operations. I was curious how you either manage yourself into that role or how that kind of came about. Because you know, chief of staff is really an operations role, then a Kleiner, and then a Coursera, and then even now at DeepMind. They've all been a little bit different, so we can talk about that. But you know, that general management skill set, mm -hmm. basically. And I, 
one of the things I think I really developed um, at my time at Purdue too was kind of that, as I mentioned, liking a lot of the classes, but not yeah. necessarily going deep into one specific area. So um, I found that uh, the engineering training has taught me how to ask questions and how to be curious and want to know how things work and why things work. And I've just been able to apply that in a lot of different scenarios. Uh, so it's something, and I like getting things done. I like being able to say, okay, what do we need to do, and then what's the, like, what's the best way to get there? And so like so a little bit of the engineer optimization side of things. Okay. So go ahead and keep, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, no, 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 I was, um, yeah, so I think that's, so I've kind of found my, uh, um, and I found that along the way I actually like working with people. So that helped too. So having both a technical background, liking working with people, and wanting to try to get things done um, was really kind of the, the right combination for me. But each of the roles have been slightly different. So for example, at Coursera, um, I didn't have engineering in my scope as chief operating officer, but I do have it in my scope at DeepMind. OK. But and how have you gone about developing these managerial skills? Because again, as an engineer, you would, like you said earlier, you would have thought that you would have gotten an MBA, but most of all, this has sort of been on the job training or just picking things up as you go. There were a few things. I think joining a large company that, that ran well and that invested in employees. So I think that's one of the benefits of going to a large company is you get to see what are decision-making processes? How do people have meetings? What works, what doesn't? What's it look like to have a good agenda to take action? Uh, so you learn some of those really good day-to-day um, -day activities in a, a larger company. Then the other thing is that they'll invest in you. They usually have some type of learning and development program. So I feel like Intel, especially going through the rotation program, invested so much in my leadership development that the, made the on-the-job training better because it wasn't just me. It was also a lot of other employees. So I learned from really good managers. I also had really bad managers and learned what didn't resonate with me, what didn't get me motivated. And so I think sometimes in those, um, when you're in a large organization, you just naturally have that. In a small organization, you wear a lot of different hats. And some people get addicted to that. Um, you know, one minute you're the finance person, the legal person, the head of engineering, the head of product, and customer support. And uh, so you can learn this similar set of skills, but it, it, it's a different, different path. Did you have specific role models or mentors throughout your career? Can you talk a little bit about that again? Even starting back from engineering where when we were in school, you probably would have been the only girl in the class kind of situation to going through and now being, you know, in the sea level as a, as a female in STEM. It's, uh, throughout my career, I've always had an, uh, amazing mentors. Um, I got used to, as I mentioned earlier, like when a class or something doesn't go as you want, you, you and you don't want to go through that again. Like I learned to ask for help and ask questions a lot. And so I think naturally um, what happened at Intel, several senior managers were like, oh, here's someone who actually wants to hear my opinion, wants my advice, and takes it and then comes back and tells me how she used it. So I'd regularly, I remember in one role I had, um, there was this new technology coming out, uh, USB. So I went and I kind of shared some of the information and trained some of uh, my peers who were much more senior than me, but they weren't as like paying attention to some of the more the emerging technologies. And they really appreciated it. And they saw that I was sharing information with them. And so what I found was I just started having uh, almost a personal board of advisors. And I, it happened accidentally. And then over the years, I've been much more deliberate. So. I think about what are the problems I want to solve. I am not shy about asking for mentorship. And one of the ways that I do that is I'd say something like, Arnold, I really um, admire how you were uh, developed your career such that you could do your role right now. I'm interested in learning specifically how did you develop your skills to be um, head of operations um, and be a managing director? Can I spend a couple, can I spend 
two hours with you over the next six months to learn more. And so I've time-bounded it. I've been very specific with my request. I've told you what I'm looking for from mm -hmm. you, and it makes it harder for you to say no to me, right? Right. <laughs> um, so I think just naturally, I had some of that at Intel. And then some of the mentors, uh, I live off my mentors' one-liners. Um, Craig Barrett, who at, was the Intel CEO, told me once, um, pathfinders end up with more arrows in their back than in their front because you know, if you're, you're trailblazing, and people are always telling you what's wrong when you're trailblazing, uh, pathfinders end up with more arrows in their back than in their front, so stop occasionally so I can pull them out so you can run faster. And so I like always knew he had my back. And so that was the kind of a management thing I took, uh, took on. Um, when I was in venture capital, uh, Bill K Campbell, who is a famous coach who has worked with uh, Silicon Valley executives, uh, made a comment to me um, about um, your title makes you a manager, but your people make you a leader. So he was very much into, you have to be able to influence people if you really want to lead them. And then another one was, um, there's a difference between a team of all-stars and an all-star team. So bringing that team collaboration into play. So I've had, I feel very fortunate because I've picked I've been around a lot of amazing leaders, and some of their one-line snippets have really influenced how I approach leadership. Okay, we're running a little bit on time, so what I wanted to make sure was that the audience got a chance to ask questions, and we're actually at a good transition point because I'll leave the deep mind questions because you'll be talking about that in your later session. So we have, we have mics that, are, that can be passed around, so if you have any questions, just please raise your hand, and then our runners can can come by. Hi, my name is Marek, and I'm a, a senior studying industrial engineering. And my question is just to try to elaborate more on a topic you discussed earlier, which was uh, almost like impact investing when you talked about green tech and things like that. So what are your thoughts on doing good through a business versus doing good in business so you can generate profits with which you then do good separately? There are a lot of different approaches and people need, entrepreneurs need to find what motivates and inspires them. Um, I'm a fan of some of the work that's happening with B Corp. I don't know if um, you're familiar with that. Uh, a, a friend of mine uh, was one of the co-founders. And it basically is bakes into the letters of incorporation how companies can, how they plan a double bottom line. So they have social impact and they have uh, profits. Like Warby Parker is a great example of that. Um, Etsy. Uh, I also think on some of the fields like green tech or some of the life sciences, these are really long uh, by the time you develop a uh, product, find product market fit, uh, remove, the, remove the cost out of it, because a lot of these can be capital intensive, um, it just takes time. So you need to find the right kind of investor who's doing that kind of long-term thinking and who understands the value there. I was just with um, uh, former Vice President Al Gore uh, has um, a, a firm, an investment firm called Generation Management, where they do a lot of this type of investing and have done really well. Uh, and it's, it's impressive if you've got the, in, and at Kleiner we had a green growth fund that was really kind of looking at also once market risk or technical risk was reduced and you had proven out some of the market risk, could you put some dollars to just accelerate the growth? So I think there's a lot of firms out there that are doing this and it's a matter of finding the right one for you. Question in back. Hi, my name is Max. So I wanted to ask, as AI starts to impact a bigger and bigger part of our life and the business, do you think there will be an unemployment problem because of that? Or will it all kind of average out by itself? I think as in every field, there is technology changes have always uh, required some uh, adjustments. So, uh, for example, if, I mean, even automation of manufacturing and the, the kind of work that the people are doing. 
I remember when we were bringing internet into places that didn't have the internet before, and everyone's like, okay, we're gonna put teachers out of, out of business, uh, they're, they're gonna lose their jobs. In fact, as the teachers develop tech skills, they went on to do other things, and uh, the initial, uh, so we actually had the opposite problem was the technology actually created more, more of a need. Um, uh, and so I think, but I do remember this conversation a lot around the internet build out in the late 90s and early 2000s, which isn't that long ago, and the impact that technology has not had in those areas. On AI specifically, I think it is incumbent on those of us working on AI to be responsible in how we think about the downstream implications and where and how this gets used. I mean, already AI is having a positive impact in manufacturing, taking on some of the more com complicated work that may be hazardous uh, for a human to do. So I like to think of it as the technology is a tool um, that solves a problem that we need it to solve versus as a replacement. Question over here on the, my left. Hi, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Andrew Gonzalez, and I'm a data scientist, but also a vascular surgeon. So I know that in the deep learning space, a lot of our innovations come from academia. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts for people who cannot necessarily take the plunge immediately to go and just go out and be an entrepreneur and do it, and still have to function within an academic environment. Because as much as I like doing things that are innovative, I have to operate at some point in time. And sometimes the College of Medicine, for instance, is not super great about part-time and whatnot. And I was wondering how you think in the next coming years, the relationship between academia and industry are going to involve, evolve to have people doing both at the same time. I don't know if I'm the best person positioned to comment on that. Uh, Arnold might, but I'll, I'll share some thoughts uh, with you. One is that I think if you're interested in entrepreneurship, there's also opportunities to join boards or be advisors. And it's a great way to be engaged in the process and learn. Um, and so that when the time is right for you, you can move forward a bit faster. Um, I also think that uh, I started, actually started a nonprofit. That's my entrepreneurial uh, activity. And I did it with a co-founder who was absolutely committed. So we agreed as part of the, uh, as we co-founded this, what my role would be as chair. And so it's a little bit different than a company and developing a product. But there are different models that you can make things work if you're, depending on what you really want out of, want out of it. Do you have anything to add? Uh, only like your Kind of one of the comments you made earlier was that when you're at a large company like Intel, you actually thought yourself as an entrepreneur. And so using those types of skills of, hey, you can still be a big company, you can still innovate. And maybe in today's world, a lot of people kind of incubate their ideas at big companies, and then at some point they may spin out only to get acquired back. That's actually very common at like Google, mm -hmm. for example. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, thank you very much for coming. Um, my name is Caleb. I'm curious because you mentioned how important it was to you and the benefits you got from working at Intel, a big company that invested uh, in their employees. Um, and now in Silicon Valley, there's definitely some companies that have like super high turnover rates um, where people just kind of come, work for a little bit, and then move on. And there's none of that um, active development in employees. Do you think that sort of culture is healthy? Um, and if not, what do you think should be done about it? Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's an excellent uh, question. So for those of you who don't know, the I don't know what the latest data is, but there was a point in Silicon Valley where in the startups where the average turnover was about 25 to 30% a year, which if you imagine for a small startup where you need that, but you're bringing people in and training them, and even if you're trying to be thoughtful in the interview process, it's still a lot of turnover. There's an interesting uh, book by Reid Hoffman, who was the founder of LinkedIn, um, called uh, something yourself, like no network, the the other network. It talks about a tour of duty, and um, if you look that up, you'll find it. Uh, but basically. You go into either a company or within a company, you might have a couple of tours of duty. So what are you trying to really get out of that? What are you contributing? And what are you getting out of it? And it's a, there's a lot of elements in that uh, 
book, or you can look on SlideShare, that are really interesting for people that are in that type of environment. I don't think it's particularly healthy um, because it's really hard to run a business with that, type of, with that type of turnover. And you start, a lot of times, people around you are competing for who's paying the most or what's the biggest job title. And so all of a sudden, you've got this job title that maybe is inflated, and you're not necessarily having uh, the right skills to go with it. So I think what I'm interested in is I don't know what the, the longer term impact will be. Um, I, it's been interesting having DeepMind in London. So we have very low attrition. Uh, we go through a very thoughtful interview process. And I think the type of work we're doing is very long term. So we tend to get people who kind of come in and, and say long term. I also think being outside of Silicon Valley in some ways has helped because when people join, there are, there's an element of commitment where, as I think in Silicon Valley, um, looking back on my time there, it's like you kind of get caught up with, oh, so-and-so moves companies, maybe I need to move companies, or oh, the cohort I started with two years ago is thinking about what's next, maybe I should, I don't want to be left behind. So sometimes there's this artificial uh, movement, I think, that gets created. I totally, no, I totally agree, because it also ends up being a little bit of the arms race of, are people joining startups for the mission or just for the dollar and the highest pay and the best next? And so it goes to, if you can recruit people who are on the same mission driven as yourself, then they're less likely to, to turn over. Other questions? There's one in the back. Hi, Lila. John Cortez. <clears throat> I was your classmate back in Double E '93. <laughs> uh, question. I was worried you were going to actually say something about what I was really like as a student. Or no, something. you hit the nail <laughs> on the head, from what I remember. Um, what's been your biggest, um, uh, I want to say, opportunity that you've had in your career, and then how did you overcome that, or biggest challenge, maybe? Biggest challenge in my career. I actually think some of it is getting labeled. Right, and in some ways, uh, um, you know, I, I mentioned like, okay, I'm a generalist, but then some people are like, generalist, you know, what value does that add to me? Like, I need somebody to do this. Like, well, wait a minute, I'm really not a generalist. I can really can do all of these things. And I think sometimes we shorthand thing, shorthand it, and maybe cut ourselves short for what we're really able to contribute. Um, I also think, to some extent. Um, I've been in several times in my career where I've been really unhappy, and I've just kind of tried to push through it. And I think there's this balance of figuring out what you really want out of your career and having the guts to say, it's time to move on. Um, one of the things I've learned is um, you know, kind of back to the, the failure, like not wanting to fail, but just saying, OK, is now the right time for me to think about what's best for my career myself um, so I would say that's another one. And the third thing I'll say is uh, whenever you're dealing with people issues, it's very, sometimes easier to not confront them. And what happens is it builds up. And all of a sudden, this small thing turns into this big issue that now feels very high stakes. And that could be giving people feedback. Um, I had this one point where somebody, I felt like someone was treating wasn't treating me with respect. And so what I had learned by that point in my career was go and have the conversation early and do it a way that wasn't passing judgment. So I went to his office and I said something like, when you do this, it makes me feel like you don't, you're, don't respect me. And uh, I wanna have a conversation about this. And what I did was I had to bring that awareness in and I'm happy I did it early because it was a complete mis misunderstanding. But I think I learned that the hard way because in the past, I think um, John Doerr has a great saying, ideas are easy, execution is everything, and it takes a team to win. And the people part of everything is always the most complicated, unpredictable. So if you can kind of lean into the times that are uncomfortable and resolve them quicker, I think I could have, does that, does that answer the question? How do you balance the, like, things are, I'm not happy, and it's sort of the, I need to persevere through this tough part versus I'm bailing and I'm kind of jumping ship? I think when you, to me, it, uh, for me personally, it comes down to values. And I've learned this later in my career. When you know what your personal values are and you're clear about it, 
then you start to figure out how is that with the group of people you're working around, because values don't really change. And I think when um, there's a fundamental difference there, it's probably worth changing. When you're spending more time focusing on what you're not doing versus what you are doing, like I'm a firm believer of playing off of your strengths. Instead, your resume, your CV is always going to have, ga have gaps. Um, but if you're always saying, what do I need to do to fill that gap, I think you stop, you kind of lose sight of what value you really add. I think we have time for one or two more questions. There's one up front. Is there a female who has a question too? I want to get some diversity in here. Come on, ladies. No, okay. <laughs> you, you can ask a question too. Yeah, That's so, okay. <laughs> wait, wait. Sorry, didn't hear you. Hi, so uh, I was sort of wondering, what is your personal drive? What sort of like pushes you to want to improve, to move forward? And uh, how did you originally find that and come up with that? Uh, I'm a child of immigrants, um, and so I think a lot of it was the kind of that, that culture that was passed down to me and that I grew up in. Um, I also have a sister who has um, a cerebral palsy and has two master's degrees and graduated second in her class. So I'm like, I, I had to persevere because I looked around me and said, everyone else is. Um, so I, f I think I felt kind of that obligation. Um, and there is nothing like a little bit of struggle and then to succeed and to get some type of accomplishment and to know what it took. Uh, and so I think that also that adre a little bit of a, the adrenaline. Other question? Here we go. Hello. Hi, my name is Deborah. And basically the question is for people for students now that are looking for jobs, I'm a PhD student, I'm in the phase that I'm starting to seriously applying and forming the vision and the career, as you said, the, what are your values and how to, to approach it. And so the question is if you have any key advice for especially women starting in the same, the same area, how to, not only how to uh, perform in interviews, but our, our mindset, how to go after looking for jobs that actually are going to be in, in tandem with my own personal and yeah. um, technical values. I Thank think you. one of the things that's important in interviewing is to remember that th they're interviewing you, but you're also interviewing them. The worst thing you can do in an interview is go in and be someone that you're not. Because let's say you get the job. Great, you got the job. But now they've interviewed someone. They're expecting someone else to show up. They're not expecting you to show up. And if what happens if you go in and, as yourself and you don't get the job? Great. Maybe that, wasn't, that wouldn't have been a good fit for you anyway. So what, did, what was it that you want? Um, so I think going into an interview with that mindset and saying, what are the questions that I'm going to ask that are really going to get to the heart of is this the organization that I want to be a part of? Um, and that may be even things like checking out their website, realizing what their values are, and asking them a question about it. It may be about their mission and asking about how they balance their mission with uh, the profitability, for example, to the earlier question. Um, so do your homework, but go in with the mindset of you are interviewing them as well. Uh, I spent about 50 hours interviewing with DeepMind. And I did that because I, didn't, I was only going to move to London and work in artificial general intelligence if I felt good about the people, the team, the values, the vision, and I felt I could make a difference. And I was at a point in my life where that element of diligence was really critical. And it worked for them, it worked for me. The onboarding was completely smooth, so um, I, it's the first time I had ever done something so extensive, but it felt like the right thing, and it felt like what I needed. All right, well, this hour has gone by incredibly fast. Uh, just a couple of announcements that we'll have a short half-hour break. There are refreshments and water and some cookies on the side. Lila will be around, and then at 6, six o'clock, She'll be giving her lecture on artificial intelligence. And if I could, one of the things I've been super impressed with um, on campus is the 
amount of activities that are really set up for students these days between all the entrepreneurial support, the work that you can do on vertical integrated projects, I believe that was the right acronym. Um, it is uh, the type of mentorship that you have. Uh, it, I realize it's above and beyond the course load, and yet at the same time, it's extraordinary to me the type of opportunities that Purdue engineers now have available to them. So I'd really encourage, oh, and international too, really encourage you to go check it out if you don't know about it. I think it's unusual to have this type of variety and opportunity um, at a university, so take advantage of it. Thank All you. right, thank you, Lila.